Hello scientific writers, welcome to lesson two. This lesson is on coherent sentences in the English language. So what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to look at some basics of English language grammar. I don't need you to memorize all of this information. Most of it you have probably learned before, but I wanna bring it back to the front of your mind because when we look in the later lessons at specific mistakes, if you have the, the grammar in mind, it's going to make it easier for you under, to understand why those specific mistakes are mistakes, and it's going to make it easier for you to understand how to fix them. There's a lot of terms that we'll talk about, but again, I don't expect you to memorize or remember all of these terms, but uh, I want you to understand the way that these these concepts function, you know, how they work in a sentence, and that's going to help us in the later lessons. So let's first take a look at the learning outcomes for this lesson. After you complete this lesson, you will be able to list and define the parts of speech. You'll be able to classify words of a sentence into parts of speech. You'll be able to identify the subject of a sentence and the main verb of a sentence as well as the other verbs in a sentence. You'll be able to explain when to use past tense, present tense, or future tense. You will be able to use singular and plural nouns and verbs appropriately. You will be able to define the passive voice and the active voice, and you'll know when to use the passive voice and when to use the active voice. Similarly, you'll be able to de define the first, second, and third person point of view, and you'll know which ones you should use in your scientific writing. So let's get started. The outline of this lesson is shown here. First, we're going to talk about the eight parts of speech. Then we will look at sentence structure. We'll look at tenses, at articles, at plurals. Then finally, we'll look at active voice and passive voice and first, second, and third person. Okay, let's get going with the eight parts of speech. You see the eight parts of speech listed here. These are verb, noun, pronoun, adjective, adverb, preposition, conjugation, and interjection. Again, it's not that important that you memorize all of these terms. You can always come back to this lesson or glance at your notes, but I'm going to go through each of these parts of speech and talk about their functions and how they work in an English language sentence. All right, the first part of speech that we need to look at is a verb. So verbs are very important in the English language. They are what gives a sentence its action, if it has action, or they talk about the state of being. A verb is necessary for a complete sentence. If you have a set of words and it doesn't have a verb in it, it cannot be a sentence. So that's an important thing to keep in mind for, for English. So let's look at some example sentences here. Brian writes every day. So writes here is an action verb. It's showing action. So I'm writing, uh, typing on my laptop. Brian is a teacher. So it's talking about me. I am a teacher. So this is a state of being. It's telling what I am. I am a teacher. Now here's another sentence. Brian felt cold during the winter. So felt is a verb here and it's talking about my experience. So my experience of feeling cold. Well, let's look at some more examples in scientific sentences. Okay, here's the first one and I have all of the verbs highlighted in the blue color. So the first sentence says, expression studies highlighted important differences in response to iron deficiency between soybean and model species. So here the verb is highlighted. The studies highlighted the differences. Uh, the second sentence, soybean is an agronomically important crop originally domesticated in China in 1100 BC. So we have a state of being verb, is, and we have a second verb in this sentence, domesticated. So the domesticated is more of an action verb. And then the third example of a verb is, we conducted more in-depth phenotyping to identify the first time point during grain development in which differences in grain length are established between P1 nils. 
So the first verb, conducted, is the main verb in the sentence, and it's an action verb. The second verb in the sentence, are, is a state of being verb. Okay, let's look at nouns. Nouns are a person, place, thing, living thing or not living thing, a feeling or an idea or a concept. So they cover a lot of ground. Let's look at some examples. Let's look at some examples. And in each of these examples, I have highlighted the nouns in red. Expression studies highlighted important differences in response to iron deficiency between soybean and model species. So you see five different nouns in that example. Second sentence, soybean is an agronomically important crop originally domesticated in China in 1100 BC. So these are the same sentences we saw with the verbs, but now we're looking at the nouns in the sentences. We don't see a person in any, in any of these sentences. We do see a place, China, and we do see some things, soybean, crop, and we do, do see some ideas like deficiency and differences. We also see a time, 1100 BC. This is, a, this is also a noun. Now going along with nouns, we have pronouns. Pronouns are parts of speech that take the place of a noun in a sentence, and they do that to avoid repetition. So examples of pronouns are I, you, we, they, he, she, me, you, us, them, him, her, it. And there can be other pronouns, but those are some examples. So let's look at how they are used in two different examples. Firstly, we have the sentence, since sorghum grains are important as food, numerous studies have been conducted on traits related to grain weight and more than 100 quantitative trait loci for it have been identified. So you see there in the bold and green, first I have the noun, grain weight, and then I have a pronoun, it. So the it refers to grain weight. So what they could have done in this sentence is say, um, numerous studies have been conducted on traits related to grain weight, and more than 100 quantitative trait loci for grain weight have been identified. But that is repetitive, it's kind of redundant, and it feels weird to say it that way. So we just use a pronoun. It makes the sentence faster to read and smoother, and you understand what the it is referring to. The second example is we also identified transcription factors within our data set to observe how they correlate with gene expression in response to iron stress. So they is standing in for transcription factors. The noun is transcription factors, the pronoun is they. So again, the authors could have written it this way. We also identified transcription factors within our data set to observe how transcription factors correlate with gene expression in response to iron stress. But that's awkward and repetitive. So the pronoun is a good way to solve that repetitive problem. Next, we have adjectives. What are adjectives? These are descriptive words. They provide information about a noun or a pronoun. And uh, the adjectives include articles like a, an, and the. Adjectives answer questions such as what size, what color, what type, etc. So they answer questions of what. So if you take your noun and you ask what about that noun, an adjective is going to answer it. Let's look at some examples here. Expression studies highlighted important differences in response to iron deficiency between soybean and model species. So the bolded gold colored words are the adjectives here. So we could just say studies highlighted differences in response to deficiency between soybean and species. But you say, well, what studies? What studies highlighted differences? Expression studies. And what about these differences? Important differences. The authors are focused on important differences, not unimportant differences. What kind of deficiency? Iron deficiency. What kind of species? Model species. So you see how the adjectives are answering that what question. Here's another example. Soybean is an agronomically important crop. 
originally domesticated in China in 1100 BC. So we could just write soybean is a crop, but you know that's obvious. So you would ask what's important about soybean as a crop. Um, so it's important agronomically. Those are two adjectives. It's agronomically important crop. Okay, now let's look at adverbs. Adverbs are kind of like adjectives in that they provide additional information about verbs. It's mostly about verbs, but they can also provide information about adjectives and other adverbs. So adverbs answer questions when or how. So we saw before that adjectives answer questions of what. Adverbs answer questions of when or how. Let's look at some examples. A supplemental nutrient solution was added daily to maintain proper plant nutrition. So which, which of these words that are colored and bolded here are the verb? Was added is the verb. So what's the adverb? It's daily. So daily is providing more information about when the nutrient solution was added. It was added daily. Plant tissues were flash frozen in liquid nitrogen and stored in a minus 80 degrees C freezer. So what is the verb here? Frozen. How was it frozen? Flash frozen. So flash is an adverb to frozen. It, it, it describes how it was frozen. It was flash frozen, which means it was frozen very quickly, as quickly as possible. A third example is shown here. Soybean is an agronomically important crop, originally domesticated in China in 1100 BC. So the verb here is domesticated, and the adverb is originally. Let's look at prepositions. So the key to remembering what a preposition is, is to break this word down. Preposition. It's pre-telling you the position of something that's in this sentence. So prepositions are words that provide information about relationships in time, place, or position. They're linkers. They usually connect noun phrases to another part of a sentence. So some examples of prepositions are in, into, than, like, through, above, below, over, under, outside, within, on, at, by, from, with, before, after, for, during, about, out, of, to, up. Now this is not a complete list, it's just some examples of prepositions. Let's look at, at how they're used in some example sentences. Plant tissues were frozen in liquid nitrogen and stored in a minus 80 degrees C freezer until RNA was isolated. So we see plant tissues were flash frozen. That could be a complete sentence but you want some more information about it. So they were flash frozen in liquid nitrogen and they were stored how? In a minus 80 freezer. And they were stored for how long? Until RNA was isolated. So you see how these prepositions are providing more information by linking to that additional information about the, uh, the flash frozen tissues. A second example is this one. We established and reported a sorghum recombinant inbred line derived from a parental cross between BTX623 and the Japanese land race NOG. So we have the RIL line and it's derived from a parental cross between these other two lines. Okay, so those are our prepositions linking these noun phrases that uh, provide additional information about the main topic of the sentence. Okay, the next part of speech is the conjunction. So what are conjunctions? Well, the function of a conjunction is to connect ideas in space and time. Okay, so it's a little bit like a preposition, but a little bit different. Uh, some examples of conjunctions are for, and, but, or, yet, so, because, either, or, before, after, during, while, until, whereas. A couple examples here we have since sorghum grains are important as food, numerous studies have been conducted on traits related to grain weight and more than 100 quantitative trait loci for it have been identified. So two conjunctions here. One of them is since. 
Now you could take that sense phrase and you could move it after grain weight. It could say something like this. Numerous studies have been conducted on traits related to grain weight since sorghum grains are important as food. Right, so it's, it's telling you why they're doing something. So sense is our conjunction. And then we have and that's joining these two parts of the sentences. Okay, let's look at one more example. DEGs in cluster TL1 were induced in response to iron stress at two days, but had mixed expression at 10 days. So this conjunction is connecting these two different ideas. Um, they had induced expression at one point in time, but they had different expression at a different point. So there are two different ideas. They're being connected by this but word. The last part of speech is the interjection. And this shows sudden emotion or exclamation. They will probably not be used in scientific writing. All right, we have covered the eight parts of speech. I hope all of that made sense to you and that you understand how all of those parts function. That's more important than remembering the names for the parts of speech is really understanding how they work together in a sentence to provide information to the reader and to structure a sentence in a coherent way. And I only gave you a few examples of those. You'll have more examples on your worksheets and on the quiz, but what I would like you to do is look for examples on your own in the scientific papers that you are reading or even in the sentences that you have written yourself.